We're going to take our Bible to the book of Luke, chapter number 10. Luke, chapter number 10. Um, one, one quick announcement. There's choir practice this evening. Uh, it's getting kind of important that y'all are there for it because it's coming very, very soon. You have this week, next week, right? So, all right. So keep that in mind. Um, choir immediately following the service. The other thing is I um, found a, a, an advertisement. And I don't know what year it was. But anyways, found this the other day. It's a... Uh, it was a evangelistic and revival services with the evangelist Norm Sharbaugh from a number of years back. And so I found this in the cabinet, so it's good to see the Sharbaugh's. But I thought that was pretty cool. Um, but I, I, one thing I appreciated that it was called an evangelistic and revival services and putting that perspective in there. Like, we want people to get saved, but we want the church revived. And so I just thought that was cool. I don't know why it was in there. And so it was just in the cabinet randomly. And so apparently it must have been a good one. And so we can keep that. <laughs> Well, it's here. So anyways, that, that, that's a good thing. All right. Luke chapter number 10. Luke chapter 10. We're going to be starting in verse number 1. Um, the, uh, I'll just be straightforward with you this evening. Tonight's about soul winning. Okay. The, the, the purpose of this, and I, I love, I love the, the passage of Scripture here in, in what he's telling them that needs to be done and what they're doing and then the way that's modeled, the way it's, it, it, the example is going to be seen. Um, I, I will say in regards to introduction, we do believe in, in door-to-door evangelism. Uh, but, but the reason we believe in that is, is uh, not just as simple as like, well, that's the only way people can get saved. People get saved in a lot of ways, obviously. Um, but there's no question the pattern the example of evangelism in, in cities, the two doors, is, is seen in the Bible. We'll see that in the book of Acts. We'll see it here. Uh, Paul talks about that when he established churches. He went to every place. And to eat to every door, and so he went to the doors. So yes, how they, how do they go into every place? Well, wherever people were, where are people? They're at home, and so he went to home. They went they went everywhere, and so so with that, we do believe in it. Um, but but I don't want you to think soul winning only in the side of like okay, well, I have a ten thirty commitment every Saturday morning. One of the things I I caution about that is that when when we get the the mindset that soul winning is a program, we forget about the fact that soul winning is about winning souls. And souls are everywhere. Door to door is is an incredibly important ministry of our church. It's a programmed way of accomplishing what we're supposed to be doing. And so we we organize. But do you realize you can go soul winning? You can go door to door soul winning anytime, anytime. I, there was a friend of mine. Uh, his name is Robert, and and uh, he had just gotten saved, and and really believed that people still can get saved. And so he led this sweet girl to the Lord, and and he ended up marrying her. And so um, and it was just a it was a sweet. Sweet situation was what went on, and he really wanted to go soul winning. So we go soul winning everywhere, and, and just um, there, we didn't, we weren't waiting. Oh, it's not Saturday at ten o'clock. That's when we, our church met back at the back at that time. Uh, it was it'd be Thursday. Hey, let's go soul winning. So we'd go, we'd go soul winning, just wherever uh, we would go, and we'd cover miles. Just and, and it, we weren't the only ones. A bunch of people would do, were doing it, and so soul winning is not the, a program. Uh, soul winning oftentimes becomes a program. Oftentimes it's because there's a, um, a copyright on a name or a variety of style uh, of doing it that that becomes a problem. Uh, soul winning is not just a, a certain methodology. For instance, one of the more popular um, titles of soul winning is, is the use of the Romans Road, and that was something that was very very much popularized by Jack Hiles. Excellent use of, of of the scriptures to share the gospel, but that's not the only way in which you can share the gospel. You, you can. You can preach the gospel throughout the Bible. I mean, Old and New Testament, preaching Jesus, explaining. That's how Jesus preached about himself, right? He used the Old Testament to tell him about himself, that, that he is the one. And so when we, when we look at this, so the point is that it's not, it's not a program. Uh, so I don't want you to be convicted at the end. Or, okay, fine, I'm, I'm going to make a decision only on our program time. Now, if you're not going and you could go, then, then I hope you are convicted by it, okay, that, that you're there for those program times if you're able to go. We've had a number of occasions where people couldn't go door to door. I appreciate uh, Brother Ernie would tell me that, you know, he used to go and, and there was some frustrations because uh, he would go and he'd share the gospel with people and then, and then people wouldn't come and they, they would always tell him they're going to be there. And, um, and then they didn't show up and he just got frustrated and that happens. That kind of thing happens. Um, it happens at the same rate. People lie to you at the same rate as far as outside the church as visitors. When they come in, they'll lie to you at the same exact rate. Right? So it's not, it's not an unusual thing. Uh, so, so anyways, the, uh, the, the point on that is um, he had gotten frustrated and said, okay, I want, and then, then uh, he wanted to go back out, but his health wouldn't allow it. Uh, obviously, uh, he ex- had issues with cancer and things of that nature and, and wanted to go out and do it. And so, 
Anyways, we're going to look at this passage of Scripture, and, and I hope to admonish you as, as our friends have gone and, and shared the gospel. This past couple of weeks, we've heard several testimonies of people in our church that, that have been soul winning, and whether at, at workplace. I appreciate the testimony of one earlier. Darren was telling me about an opportunity to share the gospel with people at work, and, and others are going to restaurants and sharing the gospel there, others that are going uh, with other coworkers or their neighbors and sharing the gospel. One thing I can say about Charity Baptist Church is that we're a soul winning church. And, and I'm thankful that as far as the soul winning church, that, that that means that God is pleased with that as long as we're doing it for, for the right reasons. We're, we're supposed to be a soul winning church. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, with that introduction that's loosely connected to the message, let's start in verse number one. <clears throat> All right, here we go. After these things, the Lord appointed over, uh, I'm sorry, other 70 also and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Now, the passage here, verse 1, is describing that there are certain events that have taken place in chapter 10, I'm sorry, chapter 9, and the chapter number 10 in light of these things. And so we have to remember that as uh, he was in Samaria, for instance, his face was set as, as, um, as to Jerusalem. He, that's where he's going. We saw that last week. We, we tracked basically all the ways in which he's planning on going to Jerusalem. Since he's going to Jerusalem, he's going to Jerusalem to die for them. And some people didn't like that. Some people shied away from that kind of thing. People got distracted because they had an expectation of what they wanted Christ to be. But Jesus Christ came to go to Jerusalem. He came to die on the cross. And that's why Jesus Christ came. And so anyways, uh, before that, though, in chapter 9, one of the things that you'll find is at the beginning of chapter 9, that people were sent out. And at verse number 1 of chapter 9, then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils to cure diseases. And verse 2, and... He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So at this point, chapter 9, you have 12 people. That's not a lot of people, but, but anyways, it's still, you know, it's a good group of people. And I enjoy it whenever we have 12 of us going out door to door. It's exciting. Um, but the next chapter, chapter 10, after he's explained these things, and by the way, he's fed thousands of people, hasn't he? He has fed 5,000 people, in fact, in the last chapter. People are really excited about what God is doing. But then in chapter number 10, it says that now he's got 70 people. Now, that's a really good number. I would be excited any day if we were to show up here next Saturday and we had 70 people here at 1030 ready to go to soul winning. Wouldn't that be exciting? That, that would be good. But that's also kind of a letdown when you have 5,000 people just following you and only 70 are now ready to do this. Now, it's not that only 70 are following him, but these, are, these 70 are, are now employed, and I don't mean employed in the sense of like they have a job that they've been hired to, but literally they have set, been set aside for this purpose. So it's possible that there's a lot more, but the point is on this mission, there's 70 people that are going to go and um, they're going to tell about Jesus. Now, chapter 9 describes that the 12 were going out to preach the kingdom of God. In chapter number 10, it says that they're going before him. So this is the advanced team for Jesus. Now, I think this is great. Jesus is going city to city, town to town. He's preaching uh, the kingdom. He's, he's demonstrating that he, in fact, is the Christ. And what he does is he sends out these 70, peop 70 people in advance saying, Jesus is coming. Here he is. You've heard of the Messiah. This is about the Messiah. And Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is that Christ. And so they're able to understand that. Now, how cool would that be to know it, that you can go to a community, go knock on the door and say, hey, Jesus is coming. He's on his way. He'll be here next week. How far is he? In fact, he's coming up the road right now. You got to hurry. Now, I, I, I read that. I'm thinking, wait a second. That sounds kind of familiar. I don't know the time. I don't know what time frame. It might be 100 years from now. It might be a couple years from now. It, it could be very, very soon. The point is this, that when we consider the, the time frame, we understand something. He is coming. And today is sooner than it was yesterday. And so when we go and knock on a door, when we go share some with somebody at Kroger or at Walmart or Costco or wherever, when we talk to our neighbors, he's coming. We know he's coming with the same enthusiasm and that same confidence they had here going town to town back in, in uh, Luke chapter number 10. Here he comes. And Jesus is saying, I want you to go before me and tell people I'm coming. Powerful. Powerful. What are they doing? They're soul winning. They're soul winning. Uh, now, go down to verse number 2. Notice what it says there. Therefore said he unto them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Continue reading just a little bit. Go, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Carry neither purse nor scrip nor shoes, and 
salute no man by the way. Um, the next portion is going to be about those that, that welcome him, those that don't. But if you'll go down to verse number, um, se- let's go to verse number 17. Uh, and the 70 returned again. So what was the result? The 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Now, there's a lot of preaching out of there, but we're just going to keep going. The whole point is explaining who he is and his authority over him, right? Uh, in other words, w- when Satan fell, Christ was still in charge, okay? So this is not something that, that he became suddenly new when he was born. He is the pre-existent, pre-existing Christ. Um, so in verse number 19, Behold, I give you unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes, even so, Father. For so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is, but the Father, and who the Father is, but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. And so in other people, in other, in other words, a lot of people in the past wanted to see this. So let's pray, and then we'll, 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 uh, we'll continue with a, a few points from this. Our Lord God, we ask that you would do a work in our church tonight, and um, Lord, I, I know it's not with the uh, attendance that we had this morning. There's a lot of children and families that aren't here this evening, but Lord, I believe that there's a work that you can do in this group of people that would be, um, that would be special, that would be powerful, and so much as to the level in which we would submit to your instruction. God, I'm praying, Lord, that truly my, my de- desire before, before men here and before you, more importantly, is that I would be moved aside for your message to be able to be most powerful here. God, I'm praying for the conviction in which the words are spoken this evening, the authority uh, with, with clarity to proclaim your, your instruction for people, and that our church, our church would be a, a great soul-winning church. The Indianapolis would be different because of the fact that Charity Baptist Church is here. Not that it would be slightly better, Lord, but truly transformed because people are getting saved lives are being changed. So we ask this, Father, that you accomplish this work. In Jesus' name, amen. The, um, the passage of Scripture here is telling a story of, of soul and during the time of Christ. And, uh, and as I read it, I compare, and I, I'm more excited in the way I'm reading it because I, I kind of have my way of like visualizing how this is going and how it translates into our modern day as far as what, what this is looking like as well. But, um, but with this, they're going in places that really 70 people is just not enough. Um, our communities now are quite large compared to communities back then, but it was still an example to go and, and preach the gospel. If you think about it, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, he says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. And here's what he says, For some have not the knowledge of God. And he's saying in Corinth, now, what we know of history in regards to Corinth, in regards to history, we believe that Corinth was somewhere between 500 and 800,000 people. That's a pretty big city back then. Very big. It's huge, actually. But do you realize that Indianapolis is just barely bigger than that? Uh, Indianapolis is considered the 11th largest city in the United States. The greater Indianapolis area, 1.2 million, considering Indianapolis, Beach Grove, Speedway, Avon, Carmel, those, those communities combined is greater Indianapolis. Uh, within the city itself, 860 uh, million, I'm sorry, 860,000 people. And so, um, so anyway, there's a lot of people. If you look at Marion County, somewhere over 900,000 people. And so we're getting close to, let's say, uh, close to a million people. 
And, uh, and yet with them, Corinth was, uh, was a rather new church based on what you find in the book of Acts and what you're seeing there in 1 Corinthians. And he's saying, hey, you guys need to get right. And Corinth, you've got a lot of issues. You need to awake, awake unto righteousness. They're, they're, you're messed up, but he's, well, t what he's telling them. And you've got all sorts of sin that's, that's bogging you down. It's limiting you from what you're able to do. And so what he tells them, why? For some have not the knowledge of God. They don't know God. They don't know the true God. There's all sorts of pagan practices, a lot of things going on there. And he finishes that verse with this, I speak to your shame. And I think, well, wait a second, Corinth may be even a large church. We don't know how big it was. It's possible that it was in the hundreds, maybe it was even in thousands, kind of like the stuff that was going on in, in, um, in Jerusalem, right, where thousands of people are getting saved. But here's the issue. It's just a couple years old. These guys in their infancy as a church, he says to them, shame on you because there's a bunch of people in Corinth, a city of possibly 800,000 people that don't know about Jesus. They, they, didn't, they didn't live in a time period where they can get online and put some Facebook ads and YouTube videos out there and billboards and buses. and They didn't have that. Here's what they had. They had people that can go tell people. They didn't have printing presses where they can pass out tracts. They had none of those. They could just go and tell people. And he says, shame on you that Corinth doesn't know. We, we don't have a church of 1,000 people, um, but we do have a lot of resources at our, our, at our, at our hand, at our disposal. He tells them, hey, you need to do this. And what a haunting thing to think that as Charity Baptist Church, there's a lot of people that need to know about Jesus Christ. The exhortation to you on this is not just that, hey, you're just not doing enough. Well, that may be true. But the point is that we should not lose resolve in the necessity of going out there to preach the gospel. We have this year, we've knocked on over 3,000 doors. Praise God for that. How long did that take? That took over 2,000 hours of time to knock on 3,000 doors. So that's good. But I know we could do more. We shared the gospel with over 260 people, over 78, I believe 78 or more have been saved on door to door. We praise God for that. Not to mention the other people have been led to the Lord through other endeavors through the church as well. And so with that, we believe in soul winning. We believe that people can be saved and need to be saved. And so we get out there, but there's a lot of people. Now, I get excited when Jason will, well, he keeps track of the map and the areas that we're covering. And you see the colored areas, the part that we've, we've colored in that, that we've covered. And it looks really good blown up to like a quarter mile magnification uh, but then you you keep expanding and, and you look at all of Indianapolis and, and you can put your finger to cover the area that we've covered and so there's still a lot of people within our communities we have a couple hundred thousand people within the two townships that we border here on 38th Street and we've covered 3,000 of those doors within the past year obviously we've knocked on many more of those we've, met, we've spent many more thousands of hours in trying to reach this community you might say, well, it seems like a lost cause. I would submit to you if that labor was made for the purpose of sparing one soul from an eternity in hell is well worth it. Amen. It needs to be done. They preached Jesus is coming, and we preach Jesus is coming. They're looking forward to Jesus. They're telling them of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians 69, it says, For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. We do so in a time frame that, yes, it is difficult. In fact, I want you to look through this passage of Scripture um, in this, by the way, Psalm 68, verse 11, the verse I meant to read. The Lord gave the word, great was the company of those that published it. That's good. That word doesn't mean publishing like, as like printing it. Literally means proclaiming it. Great is the company of those that proclaim the word of God. Now, a couple things about this passage of scripture. First off, I want you to notice the harvest. What he tells us here in verse number, um, verse number two is that the harvest truly is great. Here's the whole point of it. There are a lot of people. The harvest, we understand, has to do with the people, the souls. In John chapter 4, verse 35, he describes it this way. Say not ye that there are, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. The point is, don't have the mindset, well, we still have time. Take your time. In other words, there should be an urgency to the salvation of souls. He says, Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And what he's telling them there is when you look across the sea of people that you will see, they are ready. They are ready to be plucked up. The whole concept of white unto harvest doesn't mean that um, they, they are now just barely becoming ripe. What he's describing here is that they're getting ready to be wiped out. We're getting ready to replant, if you will. We've got to get rid of all the stuff that's there. This is the end. In other words, it's close to, if we can picture it this way, it's close to judgment. Now, I would say it's closer to judgment 2,000 years after this was spoken. 
And as we consider that, we're looking at people that this is it. It's getting ready to be burnt up. It's getting ready for those things. And so what he would tell you here, he says, I want you to look. When we look, we look with compassion. We look with the necessity of a soul that will spend an eternity somewhere. The whole point of that is that there are people right now that are ready to be saved. They are white unto harvest. It's time. When, when we think about what needs to be done, we think about the parable of the seed and the sower. The important job is not that necessarily we always prepare the ground. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's, he's getting the ground ready for when he would show up. That's why he's sending people out there to proclaim him, to, to uh, preach about him and the kingdom. And as they're doing so, the, the necessity is not that we make it as ready as possible, but that we proclaim it. There are times where the seed, as it's received by the soil, is, uh, is received well because the soil is prepared. Sometimes it isn't. The job of us, uh, what we do, is just to simply cast the seed. We just get it out there. And so when we think of the harvest, the question is, which ones are ready? I don't know. Anyone. It's amazing to me the number of people that, um, that will receive Christ that you just wouldn't expect them to. Uh, Matt and I, I, you'll probably know who I'm talking about with this, but um, there was an individual who went door to door um, and knocked on their door. I think it was the first door we knocked on. And, and, uh, as, and Matt was actually sharing the gospel. And so as he's sharing the gospel uh, with her, I'm thinking, I'm, I'll just be honest, I'm thinking in my mind, she, she just doesn't care. She's like completely checked out and probably wanted to get to her next thing. And so I'm praying. I'm just praying. I'm a silent partner, so I'm standing back praying. And I, I'm not, by the way, silent partners don't get down on their knees and like cry out to God or anything. Um, it, it, was, it was, you know, just a silent rocket shot up to heaven there to talk to him and, and plead for this person's cause. And so anyways, at the end of the gospel presentation, he asked her, do, do you, do you, do you want to uh, get saved? Do you want to call on Jesus to save you? And uh, I said, yeah. I'm like, whoa, no, wait a second. You, you weren't interested. I didn't see those facial expressions. I didn't see those emotions. I didn't see the tears coming down. But here, here's what she did. She didn't know. She knew she needed the Savior. And she got saved. Praise God. She's actually come to church. And, uh, and she, she's not as coming frequently or regularly. But the point is that she's come and, and we continue to minister to that individual. But in those things, it does work to share the gospel. We don't know. And likewise, there's been times where I, I will preach the gospel with someone. I would share the gospel with someone, and they're with me, and they're paying attention, and they seem to agree with everything. Okay, this is good. Okay, would you like to accept Christ as your Savior? No, nah, not right now. Not right now. Doesn't make any sense. Uh, Justin and I were out last, uh, not yesterday, but the week before, and, and um, with somebody else. I can't remember who the other person was. I can't remember. Anyways, uh, I think it was Wade. And so, anyways, we were out there, and... Um, while we're, we're sharing the gospel with someone, this person agreed, like, yeah, this is important. You're going to be somewhere forever. Yeah, that's more important than what we do here. Absolutely. Uh, and it's, it's more important that you know what's going to happen to you. Yes, absolutely. So let's, let's take some time and, and go through what, what the Bible says about how you can know for sure. Mm, not right now. You just said it's important. You just, ah, it's, no, no, not right now. That boggles my mind. But the point is, it's not my job to make sure that the soil is prepared. My, so, my job is to give out the seed where the harvest is, is at, so, we, so the harvest can be made. Uh, the next part, so we have a huge harvest. The point is, it's a big, big area. We think about the size that we're in. I, I talk to young people, and um, oftentimes some, some that are preparing for ministry, not, not too many recently. But we tell them, hey, you can come to Indianapolis, you can serve here, and there's a million opportunities to reach people. Literally. I mean, there, there's literally a million people in this area. You can go and reach people anywhere. And when we go, generally, we don't find a lot of people that are saved. I say, oh, well, most of Indianapolis is saved. Not remotely true. I've heard preachers talk about Indianapolis saying, well, Indianapolis has already been evangelized. They're obviously not going door to door because most people I talk to have zero concept of salvation. Not just kind of, I'm talking a works-based idea that they can save themselves by their good works. I'm not just talking about a Catholic or a Episcopalian or whatever it may be or, or some kind of apostate Baptist. What I'm talking about is people that generally have no concept whatsoever, anybody. And most people I meet are not saved, not because I determined that their mode of salvation was wrong, but simply they deny that it's Christ alone that can save them. We have that light to show them. The harvest is great the word great literally means that it's vast it's big it's abundant it's a lot number two the labors notice what he says here it says the harvest truly is great but the laborers are few the labors are few remember the job of the labors is not to prepare um, the hearts it's simply to share it and and prepare them only by sharing it that's what we do 
There are times as laborers that we go out and we don't see the conversion of the individual, right? We go that may, you may be sharing the gospel with a neighbor, maybe you're sharing it with your parents, with a child, uh, with a, a close family member, and, and you share the gospel and they just don't receive it. You have to remember, they were going out there and they just spread the word. They shared the word, they preached that hey, Jesus is coming, they proclaimed it. Jesus is coming, here he comes. But at some point, Jesus Christ came. And he preached to them that he is that Christ. Now, in those things, the job of the laborer sometimes can get discouraging. But the point is, it's such a vast quantity of work that needs to be done. There are not enough labors. He says in this passage of scripture, there's not enough. He's saying that the labor is vast. In fact, he's saying that there's not enough. That's why we need to pray for more labors. Now, the good news about that is that every time there's someone saved, there's another laborer. The problem is that sometimes laborers don't do work. If you don't believe me, go to any establishment that hires people. And sometimes you find that laborers don't do what they're supposed to do, right? It's true, but would you then say they're not laborers? Well, they, are, they are laborers. They're just not doing their job. And I think sometimes that's us. And by the way, as Christians, as believers, sometimes we just don't do our jobs. But the point is this, the laborers are still needed. This puts an urgency on the present laborers who are putting their hand to the plow to get out there and put that work out there. Also to encourage the other believers who are simply not laboring yet, praying for new laborers to be converted, more people to be saved so that other people can get out there. To bring in the laborers that would be able to do the work. We need to do that. And so would you pray for laborers? I pray for laborers for our church. Uh, it was two years ago we began praying specifically. And I remember at um, the, the New Year's service we were praying for laborers. One of my concerns is that, that we were... Um, we were, I, I would drive through Indianapolis, man, it just burdened me. I'd, I'd drive specifically on Sunday mornings on the way here, and we'd see cars everywhere. And occasionally my kids would say, oh, there must be a lot of people going to church today. <laughs> right? Uh, they just spend, uh, the church may be, I mean, they're going to worship something. Uh, they're going to be at, at a grocery store. They're going to be at a ball game. They're going to be at anything else besides church. And it's sad to me, if you think about it. Uh, of churches within our city, an informal poll was conducted of call, calling around churches, of churches that claim to preach Christ alone for salvation. Um, now, this is very broad, very, very broad. And of those, now, it wasn't a full study on all the doctrines of the churches, just generally those that claim that they preach Christ alone for salvation. Of the nearly million people in this area, the total, based on what those churches were saying, around 35,000 people were going to gospel preaching churches. Now, how many of them are preaching the gospel? We don't know. 35,000 people is a good-sized town. In fact, I, I came from Baymanette, Alabama, a town of 8,000 people. So that's a couple of those towns. And, and in those couple of towns, yeah, I'd be excited that there's every single person in town was going to church. But the point is that that means that there's still over 900,000 people that are not even attending church, uh, not attending a gospel-preaching church, definitely. And so we need to get out there. There's a necessity for labors. Be praying for labors. Be the labors you're supposed to be. Uh, in this, look, look what he tells us here, verse number three. Notice the, um, the, the battle, the battle. Whenever we go to win, win, the, um, win the lost, wherever it may be, you are in a battle. In verse three, he says, go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. At, at, at first sight, that sounds okay. We're lambs amongst wolves. It's dangerous. But it's even more dangerous if you consider the, the components involved there. It's dangerous when there are wolves around the lambs, right? That, that's what happens. But you don't send a lamb into a den of wolves. It's not something you're supposed to do. And Jesus is saying, hey, I, I, I know what's going on. I know that as, as believers, and what I've just instructed you in, we just went through the Beatitudes not too long ago, and, and what you're supposed to be, blessed are the meek, right? Blessed are the poor in spirit. You're going to wolves, and you are outnumbered by the wolves, and we're throwing you into there. And so they're going there, and so he's warning them. This is what's going to happen. You're going to be lambs going before wolves. We are jumping into battle. That's what's taking place. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, for we, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. While there may be administrations and individuals and politicians that are against what we do, city ordinances, uh, the police, uh, we've been stopped by the police for doing things that were perfectly legal in what we were doing, but they're saying, no, you can't do this kind of thing. In that, in those things that are going on, we are in a battle that's not simply the police, it's not the city ordinance, it's not just politics. What he's telling us here, it's not flesh and blood. This is a spiritual battle that's taking place. 
And in the spiritual battle, we only have God who will then fight for us. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, it says, But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know, at Philippi, well, the point is that they went and preached boldly unto them there in Thessalonica. That's what he did. Yet they were treated badly. There is a battle that's going to be taking place. So when we think about preaching the gospel, here's what happens. And I've, I've had times where I've preached about just simply going out there, and I've preached from Acts chapter 17 about turning the world upside down. It's exciting to talk about going and do that. But one of the realities about that is this. It's hard to do, isn't it? It's hard to do. Not everybody likes it. I, I, it's, it's not fun to have uh, people slam the door in your face. I remember one guy, his name was Austin. I, I, I was telling him, I, I told him, look, listen, nothing's going to happen. It's not like, you know, I've never been bit by a dog or anything like that. And Well, of all the things I could have said, of all the things I could have said, I said that. And I was going down one street, and then I look back as I see this, this kid running, uh, this young man running, and a dog chasing behind him. And there goes Austin, crosses the street from one of the cross streets with his dog chasing after him. I see him later. Um, and, and anyways, he said, yep, the dog chased me. And he showed me the bite marks where he bit him on the ankle. It happens. It happens. Uh, the point is that we're not doing this because, oh, well, it's going to be easy. Life is just going to be so wonderful. And, and, and everything is just going to be hunky-dory. It's going to be the happiest thing in the world if you do this. Sometimes it's rough. Sometimes it's rough. Sometimes you're going to come across some things that are going to make it difficult. We're going amongst wolves people that don't like what we're doing and that's okay that's okay it's the only time in which the wolf where the lamb can convert the wolf right this is something that can take place here and so with this what do we need to do in light of battle with the wolves what do we do do we prepare do we dress more like the wolves do we become more cunning than they are uh what kind of equipment are we going to bring well well here it is look at the next verse uh, verse number four carry neither purse nor scrip anybody know what a scrip is uh, well, not quite. Well, he says not to bring it. So, but, okay. So, like scripture, that would be the idea. Um, so, it's not quite the um, the, the script. Actually, I, I wondered that as well. I always thought, like what Miss Joyce said, it's a pen. Actually, a script is like a bag. So, you have a purse that would be a small bag. A script would be a slightly larger bag. It's something you carry supplies in. Uh, for instance, David, when he was going to go battle Goliath, he placed the stones in a script. So that's that's where it's just a little bag where you carry some stuff in. And so, uh, if you're going to need some supplies you're going to carry it like your lunch bag that would, that would be in your script and so um so likewise um when somebody's going to battle they'd have a script some of their equipment so they would have their daily provision uh in that so anyways in this he says don't bring a purse uh, so talking about money don't bring a script so you have your supplies there nor shoes and salute no man by the way shoes um what, the, the design of the shoes was for for travel and so if you're just local, you kind of walk around. That's kind of the idea. Now, we wear shoes constantly. Uh, growing up, I, I was told, I was convinced. My grandmother convinced me, and then my mom, like her, convinced me that if I didn't wear socks, that I would catch pneumonia. And uh, anybody like that? Like, it's the cold feet, would, you would get sick from that? I don't know. Our, we, we're testing our, with our children. I don't know if that's abuse or not, but we, we, they never wear socks or shoes. Uh, and so we're just thankful they wear shoes to church generally happy with that there's times like my kids will go run outside when it's snowing not because we tell them to they just take off in the snow and so the point is that um you can go barefoot in fact it's very common for them to go barefooted we have jesus having his feet washed on multiple or at least enlisted to uh, multiple occasions for the washing and he himself washed feet because they were barefooted shoes then would be a special protection that was for traveling and we say don't bring shoes the point of that is, like, you're going there. Um, you, don't, you don't need to plan on traveling. You just need to go to the next house. That's your job. Just go to the next house. You, you don't need to bring your bag of food and all that. In other words, all those things that you're preparing for, God's saying, I'll provide it. I'll provide it. Um, and, and salute no man, by the way. In other words, keep focused on it. The, the point of this and the application I'm taking from this is you have everything you need. When the Bible talks about what we are preparing for with battle, the Bible describes that we shod our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And for them, they're going out there with one thing, and they have, they have one message, and that message is Jesus. That's their message. The, the point on this is we have so many things that we're caught up with, and, and the church has been so divided. Uh, I went out door-to-door -door back here to our neighborhood back here um, a couple years ago, and, and I had one of our missionaries, Brother Chris Lanier, with us. And one of the doors we knocked on was a lady that we'd been trying to reach, and, and uh, she was in, she's a sociologist. And so she was invited to go to a church, and she said, Pastor, I want your opinion. 
said, why is it that the church has, has, um, has basically been the source of all these problems <laughs> when it comes to racial tensions? And uh, anyways, um, I'm like, I'm a pastor. How in the world can you ask me this kind of thing? Uh, but but the, uh, w- what I told her w- was, was pretty simple. Uh, the issue with the church and racial tensions and all that kind of stuff is, is why has this created a problem with politics? It's because we lost sight of what our church's job is. Whenever a church gets away from the preaching of the gospel, you're going to lose sight on everything else. Our job is not to be the greatest action or the greatest force for secular politics or, or for social agendas. And super, uh, Listen, I'm not against feeding people that are hungry. I'm not against clothing people that are cold. But the main job of the church is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's what the church is for. And we get into everything else. And listen, our city is in chaos right now with the number of deaths that we have taking place. It's, tra- it's a travesty that's taking place. We have uh, 200 and, what, 260 deaths right now uh, in Indianapolis. That is awful. 260 people that have been killed uh, in this year alone. We're not even done. We still have the rest of the month. A lot of people are dying. Over 140 of them are unsolved murders, some taking place with people within our church. And so understanding with all that's taking place here in our city, what's sad to me is that the churches think, well, we're going to fix it. And, and well, I, I, I rarely, my, my goal is not to waste time on all the, all the bad things that churches are doing. But there's one thing that we're oftentimes called to is that we're going to need to have the social agenda that we're going to fix it. Um, one popular one is the 10-point coalition. It sounds like a nice thing, but a 10-point coalition is going to fix it, and they're going out to communities, and I'm not against them trying to go and help people to get off drugs and get off the streets and stuff like that. But it's not the job of the church to have a social agenda when it's not gospel-focused. Hey, I'd be all for it, a 10-point coalition, if number one was go teach, go teach and preach the gospel to these individuals. A lost person, regardless of reform, is still a lost person. And what's happening here is you go through all these agendas on the 10-point coalition. They have things like campaign and promote a cultural shift to reduce youth violence, both physically and verbally within the black community. How do we do this? By conversations, introspection, reflection, and thoughts that hold us back as a people individually and collectively. That's a church saying this is a number one priority. Develop as churches. Okay, this sounds good. We can get behind this. Number two, develop as churches a curriculum regarding black and Latino history with an emphasis on the struggles of women of color to help young people understand that God of history has been and remains active in all our lives. Number three, acknowledge and respond to the impact of trauma as a physical and emotional reality on the lives of our young people and their families as a direct result of violence. It's true. It's very true. The amount of trauma is very true. The problem is that we reveal problems and we don't give them the solution. We don't give them Christ. Develop, um, build meaningful relationship with high, high-risk youth by recognizing the reality. It's very true again, but no gospel focus. Focus especially on connecting and rebuilding the lives of youth who have been incarcerated and stigmatized by mainstream society. Again, a good cause, but it's not the gospel. Provide youth advocacy and one-on-one mentoring. Provide gang mediation and intervention um, with the goal of establishing ceasefire, establish accountable community-based economic development programs that are organic visions of revenue and generosity, and demystify the accumulation and power of money through financial literacy, build partnerships with social and secular institutions of our city and with suburban downtown communities of faith, provide ongoing training for individual churches along with systematic programs and leadership developed to create, maintain, and sustain community mobilization. Listen, those, most of those are, are, are good things. They're, they're good things. But the problem is not a single one of them have a solution to preach the gospel. Uh, it's been said many times that the urban, uh, the urban areas of our society will not be transformed by the preaching of the gospel one-on-one. In other words, uh, I'm sorry, by the, um, the conversion of individuals one at a time. It's not going to happen. What other way is there? We need to preach the gospel. And unfortunately, while those may be good things, and it's, it's wonderful that a lot of the organizations, our, our, our politics, our government has a job for the purpose of the safety of its, of its people that they're serving, they should be protecting our community, and they should be identifying that there's a lot of problems there. But the job of the church, and by the way, that 10-point coalition is churches, people that call themselves by churches, and the gospel is not a single part of that. And it ought to be that our job is specifically the gospel. When we think of the, the things that are mentioned here, we're going in there with that. We don't, we're not taking a script. We're not taking our purses. The whole goal is that we're giving of ourselves entirely for the sake of people hearing about Jesus Christ because he is coming. 
The results belong to God. The results enti belong entirely to God. If you notice down at the, uh, the portion that we picked up in verse number 17, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Boy, it's amazing. It's amazing to see what happens when you share the gospel with people. People get saved. And it doesn't matter how terrible and demonic some people seem. I've seen people that are just absolutely decked out with the worst of tattoos of the things that they seem to be professing are written on their bodies, and they get, get, they get saved. I've seen people who had been just hooked, just absolutely tortured by, by alcohol and other vices and just be recovered because they got saved we've seen that take place over and over again and we get excited about that and jesus says wait a second i want you to notice something even if you can in verse number uh, verse number 19 behold i give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy even if you can do those things walking on scorpions and and that kind of stuff and and you're not going to get hurt that's wonderful except verse number 20 notwithstanding in this rejoice this is what you should be happy for about not that the Spirit is subject to you, but rather because your names are written in heaven. Amen. Listen, what we have is salvation. Salvation. This is what's exciting. We, we know where our future is going. We know where we're pe we leading people into the future, to heaven. And Jesus is saying that's what you should be excited about. Think about the eternal, not the moment. Not the moment. Be equipped with the gospel. Those results belong to God. You notice that the harvest is the Lord of the harvest. It belongs to him. He's the one that's going to conduct us. Not only that, we remember that the harvest has to do with his judgment that's going to be coming. And so anyways, we understand that at a certain point that it is too late. People are dying constantly. Uh, within the, the, the time uh, of this hour, there will be hundreds of people that will pass into eternity. Hundreds. Uh, we think about what's taking place within our society currently. Um, I heard recently about, uh, about COVID and COVID vaccinations and things of that nature. Um, and I appreciate it. I, I, several people shared this thing right now. But um, the, the, the government is trying to get out there, and they're trying to promote the, the COVID vaccine, thinking that will save lives. And, and there's questions right now about whether or not some of them are, are effective. Uh, right now, the, you have the Omicron variant that's taking place, right? And, and what you're seeing is a, just a high number of people that are vaccinated that are getting the Omicron variant of COVID. Now, people believe it. I mean, people are all for it and they talk about it and they're willing just to put it out there we're spending money to send representatives that are going to make sure that you get vaccinated uh, we're setting up these clinics everywhere at any expense it doesn't matter how much it costs uh, drug companies are, are just spiking these prices up and the government will pay absolutely anything because they believe let's just say uh, on the side of them being honest about it. so let, they believe that this is the solution because of something that's 90 Possibly something like Johnson Johnson, maybe 60% effective. And while we have a gospel that's 100% effective, we'll still put a minimal effort into it. Listen, the world believes in their solutions. We have the gospel. We have the gospel, so we preach the gospel. It is the preaching of the gospel that is the cornerstone of our faith, the work that's conducted, that which whips the devil, that destroys sin, that's going to shut down the powers of hell in people's lives, and we will not preach it. Galatians chapter 6, 7, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. In that context, he's going to continue to point out the fact that when you sow good, you will reap good. When you preach the gospel, people will get saved. That's how it's always worked, and that's how it will always work. In Psalms 126, and verse, five, verse 5 says, They that sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. That's what we're doing. We're preaching the gospel. The church of the living Christ needs to be more concerned about the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 20, and verse 20, Paul um, speaks, giving testimony of what's happened. He says, How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house there it is house again testifying both to the jews and also to the greeks repentance toward god and faith toward our lord jesus christ and now behold i go bound in the spirit unto jerusalem not knowing the things excuse me the things that shall befall me there save that the holy ghost witnesseth in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide in me but none of these things move me. None of these things move me. Listen, it's hard sometimes, and it's difficult, and there's all sorts of oppositions to the point as the gospel continues to go forward. There's great successes sometimes that we can easily say, aha, we did something great yesterday. 
Uh, I can't tell you the number of Christians that would come and tell me about the great things they used to do for Jesus. And that will move them from doing more for Jesus now. And Paul says none of these things move me. It doesn't matter how hard it got or how sexful, successful it's been. None of these things move me. Instead, he says, uh, neither can I my life dear unto myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. What he's saying here is that my life has a purpose, and that's to glorify God. And the way that's going to be done is by the preaching of the gospel. People need to be saved. In this, in this we describe the fact that he possesses our very soul in the job that we have then for him. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17, a popular passage of scripture. Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. He saved you. He saved you by Jesus Christ. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He saved you and then gave you the ministry to get other people saved. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the word unto, world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them, and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. He saved you to lead other people to him. So this is what we need to do. Timothy is told about what was first delivered unto him, the gospel. Likewise, what you see is the pattern in the scriptures is the preaching of the gospel church. We need to be a gospel preaching church. There are people that need to be saved. Your community is going to hell. It's not a pleasant thing. People don't like hearing it. But we are offering them something that would save them, 100% sure. That's Jesus Christ. So preach the gospel. Let me encourage you. Be going soul winning. Make that a priority. If you can't go on a Saturday, go at another time. If I say, well, Pastor, I, I can't go Saturday mornings, and so I can't soul win. Listen, are you anywhere there's other people? Then you have soul winning opportunities. Preach the gospel. Proclaim it. Share that news so other people can get saved. Well, I'm scared. I, I don't know that I'm properly equipped. Have you been reconciled to God by Jesus Christ? Then you have been given this ministry of the, of the word of reconciliation. The word of reconciliation is literally the, the preaching of that reconciliation. That's what your job is. So be faithful in that. We praise God for people that get saved. But there's a whole lot more of it that can be done. My, my desire, one of the reasons as I look at this, for one, it's the next passage of scripture right here in Luke chapter 10. The other thing is I'm considering where we're at as a church. There's a lot more people that need to be saved. The Lord has sent us labors. I rejoice for a lot of the people. One of the things that, that we've seen in this past year or two and the people that have come on and joined with us is that we have a lot of laborers. And as laborers, let's not waste that time. We need to be efficient. And as we've talked, my wife and I have been trying to work and plan as far as how we can be more efficient about that task and how we need to do that and how we need to reach the gospel Let's stay pray prayerful. Let's keep praying for laborers. Let's keep praying for the harvest. Let's just go out there. Just get out there and preach the gospel. Would you pray for that? There's, there's, no, there's no question there's an aspect of prayer. Would you go out there? Would you be the labor you're supposed to be? Would you pray that God would send forth labors? All this is worthy. Why? Because the gospel works. So let's go ahead and pray. In fact, let's, let's take a time of invitation. Miss Bethany, what, would you mind? Um, we need to make, make some time of prayer as a commitment as a church. Let me encourage you to be prayerful about this. The commitment is for every single person in the church to be a soul winner. Every single person. You say, oh, I can't. No, everybody can be a soul winner. It doesn't matter if you're bedridden. If you've got a caretaker, you've got somebody showing up that needs to be saved. God has given you that ministry. You can make the decision today. Let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll have a time of invitation where you can spend some time with the Lord. Our God, I thank you for the time you've given and the instruction to us from this passage. I pray as people respond that it will be a response of heart. That would be a commitment made before you, Lord. It, it's, a, um, it's my job simply to be a messenger of what instruction you've given there and how exciting it would have been to know that, that you verbally, you, you, you very specifically face-to-face -face gave a group of 70 people a, a, a commandment to go and do this. And they got to come back and rejoice with you in the work that was done. Lord, I do wonder if those 70 came back with other people as well. Or, or maybe they were just ready, just excited to go show them introduce them to you. God, I'm praying that as we, uh, as we consider what we're doing, Lord, there's people all around us that, that we need to be more burdened for, we need to be praying for, we need to understand that this is the greatest priority, that we would do so, that the main thing would be the main thing, and that's you, that's you, Father.
So I pray that you'll be with decisions that are being made right now. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand to our feet. Miss Bethany plays a song of invitation. I